89th plenary meeting of the General Assembly is called to order. The General Assembly will resume its consideration of Agenda Item 118 entitled Follow-up to the commemoration of the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade and in accordance with operative paragraph 6 of resolution 70-7 hold a commemorative meeting on the occasion of the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Members will recall that the General Assembly held the debate on Agenda Item 118 and adopted Resolution 70-7 uh, at its 46th plenary meeting on the 4th of November 2015. Deputy Secretary Jan Eliasson, Distinguished Ministers, Dr. Sheila Walker, Executive Director of African Dis Diaspora Incorporated, Excellences, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Today's event provides us with an opportunity to honor the millions of women, men, and children who were victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. It's a day to remember one of the darkest chapters in our past and to recommit ourselves to doing our part to prevent a repeat of this abhorrent historical fact. As we reflect on the past, we should continue to pay homage to the sacrifices of the enslaved Africans and their descendants, and to recognize their respective contributions to our world and societies. Excellences, the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Trade Trade focuses the world's attention on the unprecedented horror of the slave trade, providing us with an opportunity to collectively and solemnly reflect on the seemingly limitless scope of man's inhumanity to man. While we reflect on the past horrors, we must also confront current and modern challenges posed by the many forms and manifestations of slavery even today. All too many innocent people, including women and children, are suffering due to the indignity resulting from human trafficking and sexual exploitation. Furthermore, many children continue to be exploited as child laborers instead of being at school. The challenges of modern slavery and discrimination that confronts us today include institutional racism, gender discrimination, social and economic inequality, hatred, and prejudice. Ladies and gentlemen, the theme of this year's remembrance is Remember Slavery, celebrating the heritage and culture of the African diaspora and its roots. This is a timely theme as it draws attention to the vibrant African culture and traditions that have enriched life in societies once involved in the slave trade and how the African diaspora continues to enhance many aspects of daily life in countries around the world. Excellences, in 2007, the General Assembly adopted a resolution to create a permanent memorial to and remembrance of the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade and to acknowledge the tragedy and enduring consequences of the enslavement of African peoples. I wish to congratulate and thank the Permanent Memorial Committee, led by the Permanent Representative of Jamaica, Kotre Ratray, for tireless efforts 
that led to the successful con construction and unveiling last year of that permanent memorial. This memorial, the Ark of Return, occupies a prominent place here at the United Nations and is crucial in educating and informing current and future generations about the causes, consequences, and lessons of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. I also commend and recognize the invaluable contribution of the Caribbean community and the African group member states for their sustained commitment to this annual remembrance. I call upon all member states and people everywhere to do their part to fight for a world free of all forms and manifestations of modern slavery, including discrimination, oppression, and racism. Thank you for your attention. I now give the floor to the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency Jan Eliasson. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you for your powerful statement, uh, Dr. Sheila Walker, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. E each year, the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade provides an opportunity to remember and reflect on one of the most appalling injustices in human history. On this day, we honor the memory of millions of Africans forcibly removed from their families, their villages, and their homelands over hundreds of years. This important day also directs a spotlight on racism, sadly still prevailing in today's societies. It is seen in untold acts of violence, discrimination, bias, and prejudice all over the world. And it is shamefully represented by the millions of people still living in situations of servitude and slavery worldwide. Forced labor, bonded labor, child labor, human trafficking, forced prostitution are serious human rights violations rooted in a glaring lack of respect and regard for fellow human beings. They are an affront to the UN Charter and its reaffirmation in the dignity and worth of human person. Just as we reject the vile human commerce embodied by the transatlantic slave trade, so must we reject and pursue the struggle against all forms of contemporary slavery. Our battle cry must be a life of dignity for all. Enough is enough. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this year we'll celebrate the rich culture and heritage of the African diaspora. We remember their roots, their traditions, and their impact on the life of societies involved in the slave trade. Africans brought to the New World the great diversity of their homeland cultures as they forged new lives with one another as well as with other population groups. The rich varieties of diaspora culture took root and developed. In this process, persistent efforts to strip Africans of their identity and culture failed. Instead, their vibrant and strong heritage endured and spread. We see Africa's legacy in the world, in the bold art, in the vibrant music, and the inspiring literature that infuse modern culture all over the world. And we very much see it in the contributions that the people of the African diaspora have made and continue to make in medicine and science, as well as in government and leadership in society as a whole. The trials and triumphs of the African diaspora also remind us of enduring qualities of human character, fortitude, courage, strength, tolerance, resilience, passion, and compassion. Remember, nothing happens in life without passion, and the wrong things happen without compassion. So passion and compassion is what we need to be reminded of in our constant struggle to improve conditions around the world. 
Last year, the UN launched the International Decade of People of African Descent. Much of the discrimination and marginalization of today can be traced to the slave trade. That is why the UN remember, the United Nations Remember Slavery Program is reaching out to young and old alike to create awareness, promote understanding, and change attitudes. On this day, I ask all member states and civil society to commit to make sure that all people of African descent enjoy equal access to education, employment, health care, development, and other vital opportunities. It is long overdue for us to break the chains that have denied so many equality and the protection of their human rights under the law and in practice. Outside this building, in the Visitors Plaza indeed, there is an iconic permanent memorial to honor the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. And I want to join the President in thanking those who made it happen. And I particularly commend Ambassador Rattri of Jamaica for his untiring leadership and efforts. The Ark of Return, as it is called, is a poignant reminder of the indignity and suffering of millions of men, women, and children, victims of slavery. I urge everyone here today and every visitor to the United Nations and everyone who watches this webcast to stand in front of it and reflect on the capacity for both inhumanity and humanity that resides within us. I ask that we repeat to ourselves and to others the words from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that we all pledged to defend in 1948 and which is equally valid and important and relevant today. And we need to make those words real. And I quote, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. No one shall be held in slavery or servitude. Let us take these words and all other commitments inherent in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Charter as our guide for now and tomorrow so that we may bequeath a more fair and just world to future generations. I thank you. I thank the Deputy Secretary General for his statement. Before proceeding further, I should like to consult members with the view of inviting Mrs. Sheila Walker, the Executive Director of the Afro Diaspora Incorporated, to make a keynote statement on this occasion. If there is no objection, may I take it? that it is the wish of the General Assembly without setting a precedent to invite Mrs. Walker to make a keynote statement at this commemorative meeting. I hear no objections, so it's hereby decided and it's my honor to invite uh, Mrs. Sheila Walker to take the rostrum. President of the General Assembly, Deputy, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, guests, diplomats, we are here to, to remember slavery today and to celebrate the heritage, culture, and roots of the African diaspora. Most people do not want to remember slavery, some from feelings of guilt, others from feelings of shame. Most African diasporans do not want to remember slavery when we think about the brutal treatment that our ancestors were subjected to. We prefer to forget slavery. To associate remembering slavery with celebrating seems very contradictory. Unless we remember slavery differently. Unless we tell the story of the African diaspora in a way that indeed merits celebrating. Current research make such retelling not only possible, but even obligatory, if it is our intention to tell the truth about the Americas and about the global African diaspora. Telling this story in new ways also fits with the mission of the 
um, the Remember Slavery program that has as its mandate to educate people about the causes, consequences, and lessons of the slave trade and slavery, and to raise awareness about the dangers of racism and prejudice. Telling the story in new ways also fits with the first theme, recognition, of the United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent. Recognition is a necessary foundation for the other two themes of justice and development. The program, program of activities for the implementation of the decade states that these activities should lead to greater knowledge, recognition, and respect for the history, heritage, and culture of people of African descent through research and education. Promote full and accurate inclusion of their history and contributions in educational curricula and raise awareness by providing information. Questions that immediately come to mind listening to these ideas about these activities are, what do we know and what do we not know about the history, heritage, and culture of people of African descent? What are the implications of knowing and of not knowing for people of African descent and for others? What do we need to know and what do we need to do in order to create respect for this history, heritage, and culture? Today's International Day of Remembrance, commemorating victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, should remind us of the foundational role that the enslavement of Africans in the Americas played in the creation of the modern world. It is also important, especially for the United Nations, to situate this Atlantic presence of people of African descent within the global African diaspora that reveals broader dimensions and implications. We should know, for example, the demographics of the Americas. Of the 6.5 million people who crossed the Atlantic Ocean between 1500 and 1800, only 1 million came from Europe. 5,500,000 people came from Africa. So, that means that during, the 300, during 300 of the 500 year history of the Americas, the overwhelming majority of the population of the Americas was of African origin. That is something that we need to know and I suspect that most of us do not know it. The unremunerated, the unremunerated labor of these enslaved Africans and their descendants enriched Europe and developed the Americas. Between 1650 and 1850, these Africans produced 75% of the commodities traded in the Atlantic world, fueling the industrial revolution that created today's economic system in which we all live. So it is impossible to tell the story of the Americas without considering the roles and contributions of the majority of the, of the, majority of the population that laid its foundations. When industrialization replaced slavery in the 1800s, people of African descent received no compensation for centuries of unpaid work. In the British, French, and Spanish empires, in Brazil, and in Washington, D.C., enslavers, however, were rewarded by their governments with generous compensation from the loss of the income that they would no longer derive from the free labor of their former human property. So the same people who for hundreds of years were enriched by the enslavement of people of African descent were further enriched by their emancipation. Now it is, it is generally assumed that the Africans who were enslaved were enslaved just as unskilled laborers. Such a perspective makes absolutely no sense given that Africans were brought across the Atlantic to create new societies in natural environments that were more familiar to them than they were to their enslavers. Some Africans were enslaved precisely because of their skills and their knowledge, and they provided a transfer of technology from Africa to the Americas. People from what was called the Gold Coast, now Ghana, whom the Portuguese and Spanish called Negros Minas, mine Negroes, were selected for their expertise in gold mining and metallurgy. In Ecuador and Colombia, descendants of Negros Minas still pan gold and transform it into beautiful creations. African knowledge also helped to feed the Americas. In Brazil, Jamaica, Suriname, and the United States, enslaved Africans planted rice that had been domesticated 3,500 years ago in Mali, not in Asia. This was Oriza glaberima, that is an African rice. U.S. plantation owners 
asked slave ship captains to bring them rice negroes, known for their expertise in the complex cultivation and preparation techniques. South Carolina became North America's richest plantation economy, thanks to this African rice. In addition to bringing systems of knowledge with them to the Americas, Africans maintained and recreated their cultures. Almost half of the Africans came from Angola, the Congos, and Gabon, the central African region over which the powerful Congo kingdom re reigned for centuries. And in the Americas today, in their festivities, Brazil's Congadas and Panama's Congos perpetuate memories of royal traditions from the Congo Kingdom. I had hoped to be able to show you images of these celebrations and of these continuities, but apparently that's not done in this kind of environment. So I hope that there will be another occasion on which I can show you what I'm telling you about. Descendants of Yoruba people from Nigeria and Benin in West Africa were concentrated in Brazil and Cuba. As a result, in Brazil and Cuba, the spiritual beings of the Yoruba continue to be feted, and these spiritual beings represent, the, represent forces of nature. And so in their celebrations, they dance, they drum, they sing, as the forces of nature visit their human children. Today, there are about 200 million people of African descent living in all of the nations of the America, with no exceptions, from Chile to Canada, including in unexpected places. Here I would have shown you Afro-Bolivians, Afro-Argentinians. Maybe you have not seen them. My favorite Bolivian's name is Juan Angola Maconde. So there is African culture every place in the Americas. And the historical contributions of these Africans and the living traditions trace an African map of the Americas. Beyond the Atlantic world, people of African origin also live across the Mediterranean Sea in Turkey, where descendants of Africans enslaved dur during the Ottoman Empire affirm their identity as Afro-Turks and in May will celebrate again their calf feast, which I attended a couple of years ago. Africans also traveled across the Indian Ocean, voluntarily as well as involuntarily. And, Af and India has several totally distinct populations of African origin from different parts of Africa, living in different parts of India, speaking different languages, writing in different ways. And I don't need to tell you everything about them because if you go to the hall, you will see the, uh, the tradition of uh, elite Afro-Indians and Afro-Indian rulers. So, unlike the Americas where um, there was no workforce and Africans became the workforce, India didn't need such a workforce. And so you will see, for example, Malik Ambar, who rose from an enslaved Ethiopian from Harar district and became a general and became the ruler of Ahmed Nagar on the, uh, toward the Indian Ocean coast of India. Um, in Afro-Indians also built monuments. You will see an image of the Siddi Said Mosque in Gujarat. You will see J Janjira Island, from which Afro-Indians ruled a princely state and controlled maritime traffic on the Konkani coast. There are also Indi um, Africans who went to India voluntarily. One was Bava Gore, who was an agate merchant. He transformed the technology of agate production, and he also had spiritual powers allowing him to defeat a demoness. And so a shrine was built in his honor at which now not only Siddhis, but many non-Siddhis also, also worship this African saint. And for this African saint, Siddhis play instruments that are of African origin, including the Malunga, that is exactly the same as the Birimbao in Brazil. So that this map, this African map, transcends the Americas and links culture of African diasporan communities across various oceans and continents. A colleague and I made a documentary called um, Slave Roots, A Global Vision. We made it for the UNESCO Slave Root Project. It's been shown here, but several years ago. And I showed it to a group of adolescents, African descendant adolescents in Brooklyn. And they had very interesting comments that went to the root of the problem that is raised in telling new stories, creating new narratives about slavery in the African diaspora. One student asked, why haven't we been told the whole story about African people, like that we're not just here in the United States, but are all over the world, not only throughout the Americas, but even in places we'd never think about, like India, where Africans were even rulers. Why don't they teach us in school the kinds of things you showed us in this film? The next student said, why haven't we learned that some Africans were enslaved for how smart they were? Why were we taught that they were all dumb and did mindless work on plantations and got whipped by people who owned them? 
Who wants that as the only image of our ancestors? A third said, yeah, why doesn't school teach us stuff that would make us proud of our ancestors and make other people respect us? They only want us to learn stuff that makes us ashamed to be, dependent, to, to be descendants of enslaved people. It's like they're hiding the good part of the truth. Whereas the program of activities for the decade recommends ensuring that textbooks and other educational materials reflect historical facts accurately as they relate to past tragedies and atrocities, the Brooklyn teenagers insisted that there was already too much focus on tragedies and atrocities, on victimization. So it is indeed necessary to educate people about the horrors of the slave trade and slavery because their consequences continue to determine and explain today's prejudiced attitudes and racist behaviors. I'm sure you can think of many of those. For educational materials to reflect historical facts act, to reflect historical facts accurately, they must also highlight the accomplishments and cont contributions of people of Afri African descent in spite of the tragedies and atrocities. The Brooklyn students and their peers elsewhere in the diaspora with whom I've spoken want their schools to teach them more complete, truthful, and empowering knowledge that will give them a sense of global citizenship, and they also want their education to offer them an honest narrative that will allow them to feel good about themselves and their heritage and inspire the esteem of others. Raising awareness and creating respect for the history, heritage, and culture of people of African descent by generating new research-based narratives and institutionalizing them in educational curricula is a stated goal for the Remember Slavery program and for the UN decade. Some of us are already deeply involved in shaping and sharing such new narratives and are seeking committed and conscientious collaboration to further the process. I invite you to collaborate in remembering that in spite of the slave trade and slavery, people of African descent in the global diaspora have made major contributions to world civilization that merit celebrating because they have enriched us all. Thank you. Thank you very much to Mrs. Walker for her important statement here at this commemoration. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Uganda who will speak on behalf of the African states. <clears throat> President of the General Assembly, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Excellencies, representatives of the five regional groups, the keynote speaker, Mrs. Sheila Walker, representative of the host country, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I have the honor to deliver this statement on behalf of the African group. I am representing His Excellency Mr. Tuvako Nathaniel Manongi, ambassador and permanent representative of the United Republic of Tanzania to the United Nations, who is the chair of the group for the month of March. Once again, around this time every year, we assemble to mark this day, established by the General Assembly Resolution 62-122, to honor the memory of the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, and to raise awareness of the dangers of racism and prejudice today. I wish to extend our gratitude to the steering committee with membership drawn from member states of the CARICOM group and the African group, and to the Department of Public Information for the planned activities and events for the Remember Slavery Program. The stories of heroism and determination and our common heritage as humanity are evident in the inspiring drama about Jesse Owen's fight to become a legend and take part in the 1936 Olympics as portrayed in the movie entitled Race. One of the exhibits at the UN Visitors Lobby entitled Africans in India, from slaves to generals and rulers, is yet another inspiring piece. The populations came from the East African region 
including Ethiopia, and mostly from the coastal areas extending from Dar es Salaam, Dar es Salaam Tanzania, all the way to the Horn of Africa. Here, once again, we see a clear link between India and Africa. We have a shared history in trade, music, religion, arts, and architecture, but the historical link between these two diverse regions is rarely discussed. Although many Africans traveled to India as slaves and traders, they eventually settled down in India to play an important role in India's history of kingdoms, conquests, and wars. Abyssinians, also known as Habish, in India, mostly came from the Horn of Africa to the subcontinent, says Dr. Servian A. Diouf of the Skomberg Center. She continues to say, Africans were successful in India because of their military prowess and administrative skills. African men were employed in very specialized jobs as soldiers, palace guards, or bodyguards. They were able to rise through the ranks becoming generals, admirers, and administrators, she says. The most celebrated of the powerful Ethiopian leaders in India was Malik Amba, who lived between 1548 and 1626. Why is it important to celebrate these linkages that exist in several parts of the world? It is important because wherever people of African descent went in captivity and slavery, they emerged victorious and contributed tremendously to the economy, art, culture, music, and heritage of the populations who are bait were their masters. We are all familiar with the slogan Hakuna Matata in Kiswahili, which is a unique combination of roots grown from Bantu languages, Portuguese, Hindi, and Arabic. This is a concrete example of the African roots. The diaspora culture of the people of African descent is a mosaic that is reflected all over the world today. The Gula, Maroon, Nova Scotia are peoples taken from the shores of Africa to the Americas, people who fought and obtained their freedoms. A significant example is that of the Amstad case that unified and advanced the abolitionist movement in the United States. Today, we have the permanent memorial at the United Nations headquarters grounds. It's yet another ship, the Ark of Return the real and symbolic return of our people, their culture and heritage, to acknowledge the tragedy, consider the legacy, lest we forget. Asentin Sana. I thank the distinguished representative of Uganda I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Indonesia, who will speak on behalf of the Asia-Pacific states. Mr. President, Deputy Secretary General, Excellencies and distinguished guests and colleagues, it is indeed an honor for me to speak on behalf of the member states of the Asia-Pacific groups as chair for the month of March. At the outset, I wish to begin by thanking you for convening this commemorative meeting on the occasion of the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and Transatlantic Slave Trade in accordance with the General Assembly Resolutions number 62-122 of 17 December 2007. Mr. President, the transatlantic slave trade was the largest forced migration in history, resulting in the extensive exodus of Africans spread over many areas of the world from 1501 to 1830. As we remember those who suffered and died over this 400-year period, let us be reminded of the necessity 
to oppose any form of slavery in the modern world. Various efforts have been made in recent years on, the, on this matter. One of them was the permanent memorial to honor the victim of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade that was unveiled just last year. This memorial serves as a reminder of the legacy of the slave trade. More than that, it provides current and future generations an understanding of the history and consequences of slavery and represents a tool to raise awareness about the current dangers of racism, prejudice, and the lingering consequences that continue to impact many communities around the world today. It also underlines the need for the collective efforts of all countries in mobilizing all stakeholders to learn the lessons of the transatlantic slave trade and to communicate the dangers of racism and prejudice that unfortunately still exist until today. Mr. President, all the valuable efforts have also been undertaken at the national, regional, and global levels in the fights against any kind of slavery. Nevertheless, this annual observance provides us an avenue to remind ourselves again of the importance of putting these fights in our list of priorities. We should not be complacent with normative frameworks that we have put in place as common reference. We have to continue to strive for its realization in concrete policies and practices. Fighting racism and racial discrimination means fighting poverty at the same time. Therefore, a stronger legal framework to improve policies and practices to deal with discrimination on any ground is the key solution. Concrete steps to encourage equal opportunity for all people, including people of African descent, should also be made in order to achieve sustainable development. Mr. President, the theme of this year's observance focuses on the rich African culture and traditions that have impacted life in countries that were involved in the slave trade and where the African diaspora continues to make major contributions in all aspects of life. Various activities have been held since last month to celebrate this legacy. It is in our view that it is important to celebrate this legacy and treat it as a valuable tool to remind us time and time again of the strong and collective commitment of the international community to fight discrimination by country, by country and prejudice, as well as to learn from the courage and resilience of the unsung heroes of the transatlantic slave trade. Mr. President, finally, on behalf of the Asia-Pacific Group, allow me to reiterate our steadfastness to fight all forms and manifestation of slavery, as well as our commitment to honor and celebrate the heritage and culture of the African diaspora and its roots. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Indonesia, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Azerbaijan, who will speak on behalf of the Eastern European states. Mr. President, I have the honor to speak on behalf of the group of Eastern European states. Every year on this day, the United Nations honors and remembers the millions of people who suffered and died in slavery. We pay tribute to those who suffered the cruelty and injustice of the transatlantic slave trade, the largest forced migration in history, and lost their lives at the hands of the brutal slavery system that lasted over 400 years. Last year, we witnessed the unveiling ceremony of the Ark of Return, the permanent memorial that now occupies a prominent place here at United Nations headquarters. As a befitting contribution in honoring victims of slavery, the memorial serves and will continue to be a powerful reminder of the unbearable hardship and death of millions of innocent people, a powerful reminder of the tragic legacy of the slave trade and the need to continue to fight against racism and prejudice. The International Day of Remembrance offers also the opportunity to remind that slavery 
in its contemporary forms, such as the trafficking in human beings, continue to exist in all parts of the world and warrants increased attention from the international community. To this end, we, the member states, undertake decisive concerted efforts, in particular through the implementation of international documents, such as the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and the Protocols thereto, and other relevant documents, such as the United Nations Global Plan of Action to Combat Trafficking in Persons. We also commend the work of the United Nations system, its agencies and mechanisms, in assisting states in countering those inhumane and shameful practices. In this context, education and awareness raising constitute essential components of combating slavery and slavery-like practices. We welcome various outreach activities and programs organized by the Department of Public Information to commemorate the International Day of Remembrance in March each year. The International Decade for People of African Descent, which is underway till 2024, is another important vehicle to showcase the valuable contribution that enslaved people and their descendants made to societies that forced them into bondage. This year's thematic focus for the International Day and Commemoration, Remember Slavery, celebrating the heritage and culture of the African diaspora and its roots, aimed at highlighting the rich and diverse African cultures and tradition that have influenced the world. It will also greatly raise awareness on the cultural linkages that exist among people of African descent throughout the world and African diaspora's contributions to society, including culture, medicine, science, sport, and spirituality. In conclusion, the member states of the Eastern European Group join with the entire international community in commemorating this important day that celebrates the struggle and subsequent achievements of the people who were emancipated from the scourge of physical slavery. It's indeed a day of celebration, but it's also a day to take stock and to deepen our resolve to tackle the contemporary challenges and combat modern forms of slavery and safeguard freedom and dignity for all. And it goes without saying that the EEG remains committed to jointly work in that noble pursuit. Thank you for your attention. I thank the distinguished representative of Azerbaijan. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Antigua and Barbuda, who will speak on behalf of the Latin American and Caribbean states. Mr. President, Mr. Deputy Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor this afternoon to speak on behalf of the group of Latin America and Caribbean member states, GULAC, on the observation of the International Day of the Remembrance of victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. This year, the commemoration is under the theme, Remember Slavery, celebrating the heritage and the culture and of the African diaspora and its roots. The transatlantic slave trade marks one of the worst violations of human rights in the, our history. For almost a decade, the United Nations and the international community has set aside this time each year as the International Day of Remembrance of the, of the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, to honor all those who died as a result of slavery, and to consider <clears throat> the causes, consequences, and long-term impact of those 
those slaved, enslaved by the slave trade and those affected today to ensure this horrific abuse of humanity does not reoccur or repeat. For over 400 years, more than 15 million African men, women, and children were the victims of, slave, were the, victims of, the, of the transatlantic slave trade, one of the worst periods in humankind history. From 1501 to 1830, indeed, the largest, the largest forced migration of the most inhumane conditions on history took place. Through the, trans, through the transatlantic slave trade, many were cast into forced labor. Those who survived this shameful horror were landed at, landed at ports throughout Latin America and the Caribbean into a life of forced labor and systematic cruelty. The developed countries, their riches, and, and were built on the backs of the, uh, the abuse of this violation against human rights of the Af African labor, forced African labor. The practice and cost is without doubt a crime against humanity and should never be forgotten or allowed to, to, to raise its ugly head again. No matter where in the world, regardless of race, class, religion, this manifestation should remain in, our, in, the, in the back pages of history, but never be forgotten. Mr. President, sadly, the reverberation of, of, the un, of un, this unparalleled period in humankind is not only the, is not only the the morans have suggested against the victims it had then, but we can still see its repercussion today, as we have already heard. Emotional, mental, and physical trauma and other negative effects that st uh, still affects the people of African descent and occurs in, in, into this generation and yet the unborn generations to come feels the repercussion of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. Many strives to, as we strive to eliminate racism and prejudices that are directly, directly repercussions of the slave trade, we must never forget. Mr. President, the, the, Mr. President we, those who were responsible for this crime continues to benefit most. Those who, that those who were responsible for this crime are still the very same ones today that lay claim to the, ho and the holes of the lay claims and strongholds to leadership in our world and making decisions in our world. You see, Mr. President, the struggle for full and absolute emancipation remains a continued endeavor and, 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 and priority necessary to, and is necessary a fight for full freedom. Mr. President, Mr. President, the brutality of chattel slavery enforced, enforced upon so many, in particularly, in, in, by particularly, into particularly, particular segments of our humanity remains a burden. We can continues to be, continues to be felt by all.
the, the continued emotion of, of the past, Mr. President, is, seen, is, still, is still seen in the fight against colonialism throughout the world. Many countries, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean region, are still, in, are still colonized. The, and, and we continue to follow the United Nations pledge for free and total freedom for all countries. Latin America and the Caribbean remains committed to this role of the United Nations. The persistence of economic and social inequality, indeed slavery, in, indeed slavery and social, indeed the change, of, the change in the social order in parts of the world is, is infor, must be enforced and we will continue in Latin America to give a full commitment to the United Nations in this respect. In fact, many members of Latin, Amer of Latin America and the Caribbean sit on the decolonization committees and continue to work on it. Antigua Barbuda, amongst others, are committed members to the decolonization committee and its tasks. Mr. President, Latin America and the Caribbean region takes note of the report of the Secretary General uh, of the, and, and the, the outlined of the importance of the report of the Secretary General and note the achievements outlined and we are proud and pleased with the announcement on the decade. Mr. President, we are also proud and appreciate the work of the committees that now that has allowed for, uh, allowed for us to stand here while outside we have the, the, the memorial that we will never forget that reminds us forever of the atrocities of slavery. At, at the national level, the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean have significant initiatives or are undertaking significant initiatives to celebrate this decade. Gulak is proud that many countries are sharing information, are sharing knowledge and experience about the legacy of African people. The group is particularly overjoyed, Mr. President, and continues to lay, continues to pay reverence to the permanent memorial to the remembrance of the victims of the slavery and the transatlantic slave trade that is situated outside of these walls. This is a significant achievement where we are ensuring that we will never forget. Mr. President, in conclusion, Gulak member, Gulak member states Join the, in, join the wider international community in observing this important day, which highlights the struggle and, ensure, and ensuing achievements of the people who were emancipated from, the, from the, the curse of slavery. It is indeed a day to celebrate but also a day for us to take stock and to cement our determination to confront, this, confront the current challenges of inequality, poverty, colonialism, and the prejudices. All of which are contribute, all of which are contributing elements that still upholds the philosophy of one race superior and another inferior. This ideology must be discredited and abandoned, even in its most contemporary form. We are strong, we are a strong people we are a rising people. We will continue to rise from this unparalleled tragedy in the history of our planet. 
the liberation of many African men, women, and children who had endured the torment of the torment and torture and attempted dehumanization and who fought against, fought against the considerable odds to defeat slavery will never be forgotten. The African people and the people of African descent will stand together. And while others may forget, while others may turn their head and attempt to forget, we will never allow this scourge to reoccur and never allow others to forget. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Antigua and Barbuda. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Luxembourg, who will speak on behalf of the Western European and other states. Monsieur le Président, nous honorons aujourd'hui les victimes de l'esclavage et de la traite transatlantique des esclaves, ce commerce honteux qui, à partir du XVIe siècle et pendant plusieurs centaines d'années, a exploité des millions d'êtres humains, hommes, femmes et enfants, en les réduisant à l'état de cargaisons entassées à bord de navires négriers à destination des Amériques pour être achetés, vendus et échangés. Bien que l'esclavage ait existé à différentes périodes de l'histoire et dans différentes civilisations, la traite transatlantique, par son ampleur, reste un fait unique dans l'histoire moderne. Son abolition en 1807 marque le début d'une évolution importante qui, en vérité, se poursuit toujours. Car l'idéologie qui a justifié l'esclavagisme n'a pas été complètement éradiquée. Le racisme et la discrimination, basés sur la croyance de l'existence d'une hiérarchie des races et des couleurs de peau, sont hélas toujours présents de nos jours, comme nous l'ont rappelé, encore rappelé les déclarations prononcées à cette tribune lors de la journée internationale pour l'élimination de la discrimination raciale le 18 mars dernier. Et chaque année, des milliers de personnes deviennent les victimes des formes contemporaines de l'esclavage et de la traite des êtres humains. Monsieur le Président, le mémorial permanent, large du retour, érigé l'année dernière au siège de notre organisation, est là pour témoigner de l'importance que nous tous accordons à ce que cette criante injustice qui a été la traite esclave et les atrocités qui l'ont accompagnée ne soient pas oubliées. L'inauguration du mémorial a coïncidé avec la proclamation de la décennie internationale des personnes d'ascendance africaine dont le but est de protéger et de promouvoir leurs droits et de reconnaître le patrimoine et la contribution des personnes d'ascendance africaine à l'enrichissement de nos cultures. En effet, le thème de cette année ne nous invite pas uniquement à nous recueillir mais également à célébrer le patrimoine et la culture de la diaspora africaine et de ses racines. Car le fait qu'en dépit des conditions inhumaines dans lesquelles ont été tenus les esclaves acheminés d'Afrique vers les Amériques, le fait qu'en dépit de leur déracinement et des répressions qu'ils ont subies durant de nombreuses générations, beaucoup de ces hommes, femmes et enfants courageux aient pu préserver leur patrimoine et le développer est un témoignage de leur remarquable résilience. Leur danse, leur chant, leur rythme ont enrichi d'autres cultures pour produire entre autres le gospel, le blues, le jazz et jusqu'au rock qui accompagnait l'émancipation des générations de jeunes. Les auteurs de descendants africaines ont enrichi les littératures anglophones, hispanophones, lusophones et francophones et les personnes d'ascendance africaine ont contribué à des avancées dans d'autres domaines, notamment les sciences, la médecine et l'éducation, pour le bien de tous. En dépit d'avoir été déniés de leurs droits de l'homme les plus élémentaires, 
les personnes d'ascendance africaine ont persévéré. Elles ont revendiqué leurs droits et nous ont rappelé le vrai sens de ce qui signifie être égaux en droit et en dignité. C'est le message d'espoir que nous lisons dans leur destin. Martin Luther King Jr. disait que l'injustice n'importe où était une menace à la justice partout. De même, l'injustice commise dans le passé à l'encontre de la dignité des esclaves et la discrimination dont peuvent encore être l'objet les personnes d'ascendance africaine est une injustice commise à l'encontre du genre humain. Je vous remercie. La distinguée représentante de Luxembourg, and I now give the floor to the distinguée representative of the host country, the United States. Thank you, Mr. President, representatives, honored guests. Today we pay tribute and honor the memory of millions of women and men, girls and boys, robbed of their fundamental freedoms and lives through the transatlantic slave trade. The horrors of slavery are a collective stain on our history. Families were destroyed, communities were decimated, and nations were divided. The United States recognizes during the enduring impact of slavery and collectively, we must work to always remember its devastation, understand its truth, and strive to heal its wounds. President Obama recognized this in a recent speech during his historic visit to Cuba, where he noted a shared history of slavery, two countries built in part by slaves from Africa, and segregation, and continuing challenges of racial bias. But he also recognized the great strides the United States has taken because of the openness of the American democracy that has allowed us to do better through protests, debates, and popular mobilization that laid the groundwork for a son of Africa and the African diaspora to become president of the United States. Today, we must also celebrate the wealth of contributions descendants of African slaves have made to continue and continue to make in our lives. From the freed slaves, who shared their stories through slave narratives, Harriet Jacobs, Sol Solomon Northup, Nat Turner, to the leaders of the abolitionist movement, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, to the early educators and agitators against segregation and lynchings who paved the way for the modern civil rights movement, Anna Julia Cooper, W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells, to leaders in the arts and sciences and sports, Elizabeth Catlett, Jackie Robinson, Gwendolyn Brooks, Charles Drew, Althea Gibson, Gordon Parks, Lorraine Hansberry, we have many people of African descent, past and present, to thank for making the United States a stronger and better nation. The African-American poet June Jordan captured the spirit of determination for freedom and purpose in her poem for South African women in support of the freedom struggle of another people of African descent. When she read at the United Nations on August 9th, 1978, and who will join this standing up? And the ones who stood without sweet company will sing and sing back into the mountains and if necessary, even under the sea. We are the ones we have been waiting for. Our reflection on this day would be incomplete if we failed to recognize the modern manifestation of the horror of slavery and the trafficking of women, men, and children. We must be ever vigilant and continue to confront and combat the lasting plague on the world. Over 200 years removed from the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade, we must do more to share this terrible chapter in human history and obliterate its lasting impact. The United States is committed to doing our part and partnering with committed allies in commemoration such as this one and the International Decade for People of African Descent to deepen awareness and understanding. We pay respect to all who suffered through monuments like 
the Ark of the Return. And I'd like to recognize the great work of Ambassador Rattray, the Caribbean community nations, and the African nations in leading that effort. Also, monuments such as the soon-to-be-opened Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, visible reminders of the past as well as an inspiration for the future. As we also join together today to celebrate the culture and heritage of the African diaspora and the diversity and strength it brings to the fabric of our nations, let us renew our commitments to do even more to end discrimination and exploitation and create a more just and inclusive world. Thank you. Thank the distinguished representative of the United States, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Kazakhstan. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I would like to thank the President of the 70th Session of the United Nations General Assembly, His Excellency Mr. Morgan Luketoft, for convening this commemorative meeting to mark the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Let me also thank Dr. Shayla Walker, Executive Director of Afro Diaspora Incorporated, for her keynote address and other speakers for their very moving insights on the significance of the day. We commend the United Nations for holding a number of commemorative activities around the world to further understanding of the causes, consequences, and lessons of the slave trade. Around 200 million people of African descent live in the Americas. Many millions more live in other parts of the world, outside of the African continent. It is important to celebrate the African legacy to further underline the important contribution made by people of African descent to our societies and to promote their full inclusion. The vibrant African culture and traditions have enriched life in the countries once involved in the slave trade, and the African diaspora continues to enhance many aspects of daily life in countries around the world. The Durban process raised the visibility of people of African descent and contributed to a substantive advancement in the promotion and protection of their rights as a result of concrete actions taken by states, the United Nations, other international and regional bodies, and civil society. Still, despite these advances, racism and racial discrimination, intolerance and xenophobia, both direct and indirect, de facto and de jure, continue to manifest themselves around the world. I am confident that the 15th anniversary of the Durban Declaration and Program of Action is an important opportunity for states to recommit and take concrete steps through the adoption and effective implementation of national and international legal frameworks, policies, and programs to combat racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance. Mr. President, this International Day is a sober reminder that many modern forms of slavery and long-established stereotypes and biases continue to prevail, all calling for strong, concerted multilateral action. Historical tragedies should be remembered each day of our lives going into the 21st century in every thought, word, and deed of ours, and not merely at commemorative observances. My country, in its national legislation, condemns and forbids forced labor, genocide, racial desegregation, and apartheid, as well as all forms of racial discrimination. Propaganda and agitation for racial, national, and religious superiority perpetuated by both institutions and citizens. The various ethnic groups are engaged in nation building along with ethnic Kazakhs and enjoy the highest civil and social status, not as, a national, not as national minorities, but as citizens with full civil and political rights. Ethnic, religious, cultural, and linguistic diversity is our precious wealth. We have managed to turn the historically inherited polyconfessional society into our strategic advantage. With governmental support, public awareness for tolerance and harmony as the cornerstones of Kazakh society is achieved in the various languages of ethnic groups through the power of the mass and social media and modern digital technology. Kazakhstan supports the creation of inclusive multiracial organizations and movements 
the country has a unique constitutional authority on issues of inter-ethnic and cultural harmony, the Assembly of the People of Kazakhstan. The doctrine of national unity is aimed at strengthening mutual inter-ethnic respect. Mr. President, Kazakhstan has contributed to the erection of the permanent memorial, the Ark of the Return, in honor of the victims of slavery, since we consider the transatlantic slave trade as one of the most tragic pages of human history, which still have lasting consequences, severely damaging human rights and international law. The erosion of international law demands from us all to, refer, to, re, to reaffirm its cornerstone principles and to commit ourselves to preserve them to overcome challenges ahead. During the general debates of the 70th session of the General Assembly, President of Kazakhstan proposed to convene at the highest level in 2016 the United Nations International Conference designed to reaffirm the basic principles of international law. Mr. President, Kazakhstan intends to continue to make every effort for the benefit of dialogue among civilizations and always stands ready to combat all forms and manifestations of slavery, racism, and related intolerance at all levels and throughout the world, as well as to honor and celebrate the heritage and culture of the African diaspora. I thank you for your attention. The distinguished representative of Kazakhstan, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Cuba. Señor Presidente, mi delegación se asocia a la intervención realizada por Antigua y Barbuda a nombre del Grupo de Países de América Latina y del Caribe. La esclavitud y la trata transatlántica de esclavos son de los más graves crímenes de lesa humanidad que no han sido adecuadamente estudiados ni sus consecuencias en la sociedad actual debidamente reconocidas. Tragedia y horror indecible fue la suerte de unos 15 a 20 millones de hombres, mujeres y niños que la trata transatlántica de esclavos desarraigó de sus hogares y que fueron enviados a las Américas en calidad de carga comercial, recibiendo un trato inhumano, injusto y despreciable. Cuba otorga especial importancia y sensibilidad a la conmemoración del Día Internacional de Rememoración de las Víctimas de la Esclavitud y la Trata Transatlántica de Esclavos. Cuba apoyó y copatrocinó la Resolución 6119 de la Asamblea General que conmemoró el 200 aniversario de la abolición de la Trata Transatlántica de Esclavos y designó el día de hoy, el día que hoy conmemoramos. Señor Presidente, a las plantaciones coloniales de Cuba arribaron, como parte de este cruel comercio, alrededor de 1.300.000 africanos, los cuales fueron arrebatados por las fuerzas a sus pueblos y familias y vendidos como mano de obra esclava en la isla. Los esclavos libertos y sus descendientes han sido actores principales en las distintas etapas de las guerras que permitieron al pueblo cubano el ejercicio de su autodeterminación. La identidad cubana fue resultado de un proceso de transculturación ocurrido con el aporte de varios grupos étnicos en difíciles entornos, primero colonial y luego neocolonial. Somos una mezcla en lo fundamental de lo hispano y lo africano. Tenemos influencias también de Asia y de los pueblos indígenas americanos. El pueblo cubano se siente sumamente orgulloso de sus raíces africanas, que se hacen presentes en nuestra idiosincrasia y en nuestras manifestaciones culturales. La cultura y la nacionalidad cubana surgieron nutridas del acervo africano. Cuba, además, ha aportado el sudor y la sangre de cientos de miles de sus hijos para contribuir a la emancipación de África, un continente 
del que toda la humanidad será siempre deudora. Señor Presidente, hay mucho oro teñido con sangre de esclavo, mucha riqueza generada producto de la vergüenza y oprobio. El destino de los pueblos del tercer mundo fue alterado con tamaña inhumana explotación y son estos pueblos los inconfundibles acreedores de la indemnización por los horrendos crímenes cometidos contra sus antecesores. Los países desarrollados y sus sociedades de consumo, responsables de la destrucción acelerada y casi indetenible del medio ambiente, han sido los grandes beneficiarios de la conquista y la colonización, de la esclavitud y la trata transatlántica, de la explotación despiadada y el exterminio de cientos de millones de hijos de los pueblos del sur. También se han enriquecido con el orden económico injusto impuesto a la humanidad y con las instituciones financieras internacionales creadas exclusivamente por ellos y para ellos. Cuba apoya la solicitud de compensación enarbolada por los Estados miembros del CARICOM. Reivindicamos también el trato especial y diferenciado que requieren los países en desarrollo, en particular África, en sus relaciones económicas internacionales. Cuba rechaza el egoísmo y la vergonzosa opulencia de unos pocos que sirve de pautas a la globalización en curso. Señor Presidente, mi país apoya y copatrocina el proyecto de resolución que cada año se presenta bajo este tema por los países miembros de CARICOM y del Grupo Africano. Reconocemos la importancia del fortalecimiento de las actividades de las Naciones Unidas y de otras organizaciones internacionales como la UNESCO en el tema. Es lo mínimo que puede hacer la comunidad internacional para reparar el crimen contra la humanidad cometido con la trata transatlántica de africanos para ser sometidos a la esclavitud. Muchas gracias. I thank the distinguished representative of Cuba, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Ghana. Mr. President, I wish to begin by expressing my delegation's appreciation for the convening of this solemn commemorative meeting in observance of the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. It is fitting that we remember the dark era in the history of mankind during which millions of Africans, women, men, and children were taken as slaves from the continent and transported from their homelands to destinations in Europe and the Americas in inhuman conditions and treated as commodities. It is also right that we honor the victims of slavery and those who opposed and triumphed over this crime their strength of will and resilience continue to inspire us today. Mr. President, mere remembrance without positive action does not make for progress or renewal. And thus, the commemoration of the end of slavery should serve as a time for deep reflection, as well as collective resolve and action to address the false ideologies and racial prejudices that gave rise to this heinous crime, which continues to manifest in racism, racial discrimination and intolerance, modern forms of slavery and exploitation in our world today. We therefore commend the efforts of the United Nations system to educate current and future generations on the contemporary consequences of this tragedy of human history. Many visitors to Ghana's Cape Coast and Elmina castles, which bear haunting memories of the heinous crime of slavery, 
have the opportunity to see the door of no return from where slaves were put onto ships bound for the Americas. Today, we are gratified that a visitor to the United Nations will also have the opportunity to see the permanent memorial named the Ark of Return that seeks to remind us of this tragedy and to call us to action. This memorial has special meaning for all peoples of African descent and the African diaspora, especially as we build bridges to turn this historical aberration into positive bonds of cooperation and cultural and socioeconomic development for our peoples. In conclusion, Mr. President, I wish to express our appreciation once again for this event and trust that the international community can give true meaning and substance to this act of remembrance by working together with resolve and commitment in the fight against racism and prejudice, guided by our firm belief in the dignity and equality of all human beings and in accordance with the universal ideals enshrined in the charter of our, of our organization. I thank you. Thank the distinguished representative of Ghana, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Brazil. Mr. President, slavery and the slave trade victimized over 15 million people. Spanning over 400 years, the transatlantic slave trade was the largest and most inhuman forced migration in recorded history. It was not an isolated incident, but part of a man-made system that connected Europe, Africa, the Americas, and Asia. It cannot be dissociated from colonialism. Colonialism was instrumental in establishing the social, economic, and unjust institutional cornerstones for the transatlantic slave trade to thrive. The scourge of the slave trade was intrinsically international in its making, but it was also international in its undoing. The movements in favor of fundamental freedoms of the late 18th century inspired a global abolitionist movement that within a span of 100 years transformed slavery from norm to exception, from a tolerated lucrative activity to ignominy. Mr. President, Brazil was at the center of this unfortunate chapter of world history. The country received the largest number of enslaved Africans. Only after an estimated four million people were forcibly brought to Brazil from Africa over three centuries was slavery finally abolished. Today, Brazil is home to the largest number of persons of African descent outside of Africa, a population of more than 100 million people, according to the 2010 national census, representing approximately 50% of the Brazilian population. People of Af African descent mark the emergency of a contemporary Brazilian culture in many different ways, from economy to religion, from language to cuisine, from sports to literature. It is an essential part of our historic formation and our national identity. At the same time, people of African descent continue to be disproportionately affected by poverty, violence, lack of quality education, and health care. Mr. President, today Brazil takes pride in the foundational human and cultural contribution that African descendants brought to our nation. Today, it is no longer acceptable to ignore the urgent need to address persisting social and economic inequalities. In the past decade, a wide range of targeted public policies were established. Affirmative action quotas were adopted in higher education and in the federal civil service, which is contributing to offer enhanced opportunity and produced many successful role models. To redress the situation of young Brazilians of African descent, the government designed a program to reduce and prevent all forms of violence against African Brazilians, as well as to promote their social inclusion and empowerment. The emphasis of the past Brazilian governments in tackling poverty and social exclusion has favored Brazilians of African descent in particular. The Bolsa Família reached a majority of Afro-Brazilians, and new legislation that protects the rights of domestic workers has translated into benefits for a majority of black women. The recognition of the importance of the African heritage in our very existence as a country has found expression in a number of concrete diplomatic actions. Brazil supported the International Decade for People of African Descent 
and to the program of activities which we expect will contribute to the full implementation of the Durban Declaration and the program of action and raise awareness in combating prejudice, intolerance, and racism. Brazil has also been an early supporter of the initiative to erect at a place of prominence at the United Nations headquarters a permanent memorial in tribute to the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade and to strengthen our collective effort in the present to end racism. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Brazil. Uh, we have heard the last speaker in this commemorative meeting. The Assembly has thus concluded the commemorative meeting of the General Assembly to mark the International Day of Remembrance of the Victim of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. May I then thank take that the Assembly um, decide to conclude uh, the consideration of Agenda Item uh, 1138 of the agenda is so decided. The meeting is adjourned.